Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is Dr. Mark Gomez, but you can call me Dr. G. And welcome to Health 360 with Dr. G. Today's topic, looking forward, the future of medicine and innovation. It's a fact that everything changes. Only two decades into the 21st century, and healthcare has already entered its next phase of rapid achievements. With the rise of technology and big data, as well as a focus on health and wellness, the industry is undoubtedly shifting. To create a better system of healthcare, it's expected that care will become more human-centric and personalized. Looking forward, when it comes to the future of medicine and innovation, experts believe a lot will be changing over the next few years as the industry of healthcare itself is impacted by so much, including people, politics, technology, and more. Again, my name is Dr. Mark Gomez, Dr. G, board certified internal medicine physician practicing out of Edward Hospital in Naperville, Illinois. I'm also a member of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine. Follow me across all the socials at health 360 wg and of course, check me on my website at health360podcast.com. We got a show for you today. We're going to geek out. And again, even if you're not into geeking out, you will be geeking out by the end of this episode. That is a promise. But before we meet my awesome guests, let me hit you with a quick disclaimer. The content of Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy driven podcast, is for your information and entertainment purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. So let's go, y'all. My first guest, he and I have known each other for a long time, friend, colleague, mentor. I want to introduce Dr. Sam G. Katua. Dr. Sanjeev Katua is president and CEO at Unity Point Clinic and Unity Point Accountable Care. He's also a board certified family medicine physician. Dr. Katua, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Dr. Gomez. Honored to be here. Hey, it's good seeing you, my friend, and talking with you today. So every comic book here, it's origin story, my friend. Go ahead and give me the details. Where did you go to medical school, residency, and why is this topic of the future of medicine and innovation important to you? All right. Thanks, Dr. Gomez. So yeah, I've had an interesting pathway. Um, I went to medical school straight out of high school in Eastern Europe. Um, so grew up in California. So that was a big culture shock for me, but it was great to go outside the country and learn more about healthcare. Uh, just in a whole nother, another world is what I would say. Um, transitioned from there, did my rotations on the south side of Chicago at Jackson Park Hospital. Did my residency uh, in the suburbs of Chicago at Hinsdale Hospital in family medicine. Um, took a job straight out of residency in 2010 at Edward Hospital as a family practice physician and the focus with just being the best doctor I could be. Um, lo and behold, um, just had multiple different leadership roles and ended up here at Unity Point as the CEO of a large physician enterprise um, spanning three states, um, 400 sites. Um, and as I think about future state of technology, as we think about how do we make care more seamless for our patients as well as our providers, my focus is, is using technology to make things easier for people, but at the same time, decrease cost of care and things of that nature. So that's where I'm here. Well, wonderful. And I can't wait to get more granular with you in a moment. I want to introduce my next guest. He and I have known each other for a long time as well, too. Dr. John Lee, let me read you his credentials because his credentials also run deep. Dr. John Lee, he's a data advocate, board certified emergency medicine physician and senior vice president and chief medical information officer at Allegheny Health Network. Dr. Lee, my friend, good, good, good seeing you. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Hey, give us your story. Again, my friend, every comic book here has an origin story. Where did you do your medical school residency? And why is this topic of the future of medicine and innovation so important to you? So I did my residency at, or I attended medical school at Loyola in the suburbs of Chicago. Uh, stayed in the Chicago area at Cook County Hospital for my residency. And then subsequently landed at uh, uh, Edward Hospital as an emergency physician. I had really no intent in be, uh, becoming involved with administration or technology, but I got uh, pulled into doing uh, more and more IT work and eventually became chief medical information officer at uh, Edward Hospital and uh, eventually uh, Edward Elmhurst uh, Health System. Um, and along the way, um, I got pulled in more and more because I saw how broken the system was. Um, and I, I was no longer seeing it from sort of the narrow siloed view of me as an ED doc uh, taking care of a single uh, ED patient. I started seeing things a little bit holistically and, and realized that there are some serious things wrong with our healthcare system. And um, I, tr I truly believe that uh, 
information technology uh, in particular is the solution to solving this problem that we have with uh, uh, inefficient information delivery as being the cause and the root of what I think is pretty much all the problems that we have in medicine. And I, I firmly believe that using technology to solve that problem is the way we're gonna, we're gonna well, find it. I love it, my friend, and it's great. It's great catching up with you and really what we're trying to be doing here with everything. So there it is. You met my guests, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Katua and Dr. John Lee. And so uh, what I want to do when people come to our office, fellas, we call that the chief complaint. The chief complaint, aka the question of the hour is this, what does the future of medicine look like? So here's the first question. I'll give it to you, Dr. Katua. So before we can talk about the future, it's important to acknowledge what was done in the past. So from a broad perspective, in your opinion, what do you think were some of the biggest health accomplishments of the 20th century? That's a great question. So um, like Dr. Lee, I'm rooted in data and like to use facts to, to say what have we really accomplished. And as we think about life expense expectancy from 1900 to 2000, I think it was 47.6 years um, in 1900 and 2076.8 or something like that. So we've seen people's lives expand and that's due to a lot of fact, multifactorial in terms of how people have lived their lives and, and different things that we've done. Vaccinations, polio, diphtheria are some examples in the 20th century. Obviously, as we think about technology now with the COVID vaccine, um, it's, been a, it's been quick to progress from that perspective. Uh, an area where I think we forget is public health and public health policy and how that can impact overall health. and. In the 20th century, you know, seatbelts, right, is a, a singular way of which we have prevented a lot of death. Um, it, it, tobacco control and, and, and how we focus on smoking cessation. Um, and that wasn't that long ago. And the changes that have been made um, from a policy perspective have positively impacted, uh, you know, people's overall health. Obviously, maternal and infant health and just cancer prevention as a whole, I think, are things specific to the 20th century where we've made advances. If you think of the 20th century as a whole, those progressions um, might have been a little bit slower. And as we think about the 21st century, the amount of data, the amount of progress that we're making seems to be happening more rapidly. So interested to start talking about that as we think about the future. Well, thanks for giving us a little bit more of that historical perspective. And I agree with you. We, 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 can't, we can't deny some of the accomplishments, as you mentioned, public health policy, uh, vaccines, uh, doubling the life expectancy or nearly doubling it. And there's more to come with it. It's amazing what we can do. And now that we have more information at our fingertips, it's how to go apply that moving forward. So I want to ask you this question, Dr. Lee. Healthcare is going to massively shift at the hands of technology. And that cycle of innovation of technology is certainly exponential. So how does healthcare go from an institutionally focused approach to a more personalized one? Well, I am actually a bit more skeptical than you. I think that there's a lot of inertia in healthcare. Um, I think that if uh, a system was as broken as, as our healthcare system is, and it was exposed to true like market forces, uh, it would have been radically transformed by now. But there's, there's a lot of inertia going on. But if we are able to uh, move the needle, uh, what I think will be the, the, the prime force common theme is really what I mentioned before, information to proper information to them. So a simple question of, you know, the, the, the common um, uh, struggle that, that the patient slash consumer has in trying to find out who do I see, need to see next? Do I need to go to the emergency room? Um, uh, what sort of, is this truly the best medication for me? Those sorts of things should be easily at people's fingertips. And if you think about what has happened outside of medicine and how we use information technology, um, uh, that's the sort of thing that I hope to uh, see uh, uh, in, in, in medicine. So for instance, if I'm driving across the country, I don't have to pull up a ream of maps or God forbid those old flip AAA triptychs, if you're old enough to remember those, I just plug in my phone, tell the phone where I'm, go where I'm starting and where I'm going, and it tells me where to go. It's super easy. We don't have that in medicine. And I, I think that uh, the secret to, to getting that really is information technology and the proper and uh, accurate delivery of information to, to the people who need it at the time that they need it. 
there is, you know, I think about the, the different stakeholders that are out there. I mean, we have to have this common vision of wanting to have progression. And there are certainly some of us that are, that, that are impatient uh, because we want, we see all this technology happening around us, but not in the fields that we practice in. And it can get kind of frustrated at the same time. You say, why can't we do this? We should be doing this by now. Why aren't we doing it? And I say, my answer for a lot of that stuff is, it's so dark complex, but you mentioned all that inertia. So let me ask you this, Dr. Katua, let me come back to you kind of building off of what Dr. Dr. Lee just said. So if there's a lot of inertia going on and, and you think about, you know, health systems, hospitals, doctor's offices, even in this pandemic, um, you know, doctor's offices are crowded, hospitals are crowded, and the delivery of healthcare has been challenged, a strain uh, right now, resource of this pandemic. So let me ask you this, when we think about how health is going to look like, what is it going to look like knowing that the, we have these barriers in our way right now? How can we make progress when we don't have necessarily some of the resources of the right-minded approach? That's interesting. I'm going to touch a little bit on the question you asked, Dr. Lee. And Please go right ahead. Touch on this piece too. Um, I'm really passionate about it because um, I think John, myself, and I'm assuming you, Dr. Gomez, as we think about why we got into leadership is you want to try to be a part of the solution versus a part of the problem. Um, healthcare is just complicated, right? Um, there are so many different stakeholders. Um, I'll just give an example. If you think about uh, as a health system, who is your who is your customer? In, in, in reality, it's, you, you'd say your patients, but who pays you? It's the insurance company, right? And if the insurance company pays you, who's the insurance company's customer? That's the employer, right? And then if the employer's customer is, it's not really a customer, but it's their people, right? And there's all these different layers and degrees of separation there in terms of um, those different stakeholders and how they interact with each other, which number one, that complicates it. Secondarily, you know, it's regulated. We don't control price, right? It, you know, there's, there's a lot of government regulations on, on the processes and how we move forward with technology. So to, to John's point or Dr. Lee's point, um, you know, we talk about information technology and data. So I talked about all these different stakeholders and where they get all their information from. None of it's connected. <laughs> right? And when it's not connected because you're different stakeholders, just the data elements there and how we use that to actually drive forward change is so difficult. And it seems like it should be easy because you think about the Amazons of the world, you think about Target, they can predict when you're going to get pregnant, right? Based on your shopping habits and your searches and, and all of that. But yet in healthcare, we struggle with some of that because, you know, we're not as interoperable with our data. So the, I think there, there's a lot, lots of issues there. Um, I would say this, not all hope is lost. I think incentives are important um, going forward is are we incentivized to do the right things to change the, how we use technology? So COVID's a great example of that. It was the one time in my career where all of a sudden we just stopped and said, you know what, all the barriers that we had, payment mechanisms, um, you know, technology shortages or changing of workflows, we're in a, a, a systemic issue right now. We're in the midst of a pandemic. Let's change it. And every health system in the country, you know, all the for profits and all said, you know, healthcare is too slow to move. But inherently, everyone moved in like two weeks. And all of a sudden, everyone was doing virtual care and they were focusing on the payment mechanisms later and, and how that was going to work out. So I think we can be quick. We just have to focus on the incentives and look at the stakeholders. The way COVID has impacted um, every part of our health system is um, something we've never seen before. The unprecedented volumes we're seeing, the unprecedented staffing issues that we're having, not just in the hospitals, but in our ambulatory settings, um, really is showing us that we do need to change because the current, the current model of how we're doing it wouldn't be sustainable. Now we're doing it because it's on the backs of our people, but imagine if we use technology in a different way um, to triage patients or predict what they needed so they come in and we could use virtual, you know, if, if there wasn't a better time to change, it's now. Um, yeah. So that's where I see it changing right now. So it's definitely, it's definitely really, you know, as you're rich in, you know, I, I, there's always going to be people that have helped. I, I used to work for, this is a doctor told me this a long time ago. He's like, you're either in the kingdom of the well, meaning you're doing well, or you're in the kingdom of the sick. Uh, and there will always be illness out there. There will always be people that will go from one kingdom to the next kingdom and back and forth. And so, you know, we see these opportunities at our hands, but but at the same time, we've got to want to make these kind of changes. And hopefully the, these changes will be driven because the alternative is just, you can't go backwards. If we're going to have progress, we've got to have progress. So Dr. Lee, let me ask you this question here. 
you know, one of the things that I think about uh, when it comes to the challenges that we see in mentioning what Dr. Katua just said, there's a lot of different stakeholders out there, insurance, insurance, insurers, healthcare professionals, new interests into the marketplace, patients, consumers, employers, all that kind of stuff. Now you're seeing big business, Apple, Google, they're even becoming involved in healthcare. So what are the pros and cons of such a changing landscape? Jeez, that's a, I mean. <laughs> I give you the tough uh, question, my friend. <laughs> uh, so the, the pros to changing that landscape is that um, uh, we have to. Uh, have to. There's just, it, it's either going to implode and be forced upon us, uh, probably by some, some future or uh, um, uh, ecosystem that a lot of people won't like, or we have to change it ourselves internally. Um, and just to give you a, a uh, a number that you probably, you both of you will probably already know. A third of, I think probably, uh, I think we're spending more than $4 trillion uh, on healthcare now. Um, 17. Uh, I'm sorry? I think it's 17 trillion or 17% of GDP, sorry. Yeah. Yeah, so it's yeah, yeah, 17%, trillion, yeah. about yeah. Four, four trillion plus yeah. trillion. Yeah. Yeah. A third of that is error, waste, and harm. So we could actually, have the same healthcare, same outcomes that we have, if we just cut out, um, actually bit better because you're elim eliminating the error. So to give you a little bit of uh, economic framework on that, that's about $1.5 trillion. That's about three times the entire agricultural output of our entire country, just in air, waste, and harm. Um, so, and how do, we, how do we squeeze that out? The problem is that we don't know where that, uh, that, that air waste and harm exists. And that's where information technology comes into play. If we can find out where those things occur and intervene and uh, stop the, 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 um, the leaking of, of that, that air waste and harm, we can solve the problem from the inside. The, I, I don't know if this is necessarily a con, but... Um, the, the problem and the thing that is contributes to this inertia is that $1.5 trillion is a lot and all is somebody else's profit. So those people who understand that their uh, efforts are wasteful, they're still earning a lot of money from it. So they have a, an, a vested interest in maintaining that system. So if you want to use, say, a, um, a consumer uh, 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 analogy, imagine if Blockbuster back in the, what, the 90s, they saw this upstart Netflix and they said, you know what, there's an easy way to solve this. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to uh, uh, whisper in the ear of some, some people on, uh, on, in some sort of regulatory agency and make sure that uh, you always have to have late fees. So even if you mail it in and, uh, 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 and, and the contract says you get to keep three CDs at a time or DVDs at a time, but if you keep one for 30 days, even though you don't watch it, you still get charged uh, uh, 17 days of late fees because the, uh, the federally mandated standard rental time is three days. That's the sort of uh, inertia that, that we're dealing with. And um, uh, we, but the thing is, if we don't fix that, if we don't make people aware of that, uh, we're going to, uh, uh, the, the entire system is just going to break on itself. I got you. All right, then, fellas. Well, let's get into some frequently asked questions. This is where we get to geek out a little bit more on some things. But now that we've established what some of the challenges that we're facing, we still want to talk about the opportunities because there are some opportunities that are out there. It's just do we have to do it? And it's like it's like talking with you, Dr. Katua, talking with you, Dr. Lee, you know, as we think about, as we're trying to think broadly, you know, we are three people, but there's still stuff that we can do together, but hopefully we can create a momentum going forward. So here it is. Let's get into some FAQs. Here's the first question for you, Dr. Lee. I'm coming back at you. Here we go, my friend. Uh, will we come to the point where sensors warn us to take care of ourselves before we get sick? What's your take? Um, uh, maybe, but I don't think we need sensors. 
we actually already have data and information available to us right now. We just have to unlock it. Gotcha. And to what Sanjeev, as, uh, Dr. Patu said before, uh, the data just doesn't flow very well right now. No. If we can solve that problem, and also actually uh, put some meaning and, and context around the data so that a single lab result doesn't mean that much, but uh, that, that low hemoglobin, that anemia, in the context of, say, a person taking an anti, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, that means something. Or if that low hemoglobin is in the context of somebody who has chronic renal failure and that hemoglobin is always low, that means something else completely uh, different. So not only do you have to have data, not only does it have to be interoperable and very fluid and normalized so that uh, that hemoglobin in one location means the same thing as the hemoglobin in another location. I got gotcha. you. And All that's, right, so. if we can unlock that, we don't need sensors. There, there right. you go. It'll be it. helpful, but but th that's the thing that that will I, I think would should be the first step. <laughs> well, here we go. Dutch Kutu, I like this one. What promising advancements do you see in point of care treatments? And I'll I'll start off by defining point of care treatments, point of care testing. Uh, it's an investigation taken at the time of the consultation with your patient. Uh, and it allows you to have availability of results in a timely manner immediately and informed decisions and treatment actions can take place in that time frame. So there we go. So what's your take, Dr. Katua? Well, I, I see more ability for us to do that. I think uh, as you think about that patient-physician interaction and the ability to do testing real time so that you can get that information there to have those really difficult discussions or talking about that in the moment, I think there's going to be advancements in that. But I think it goes in collaboration with your last question of Dr. Yeah. Lee about, you know, wearables and that type of data, you know, first and foremost, point of care or wearables accuracy, right? So if we're going to use point of care, if we're going to use wearables, and to what we talked about, people coming in on the for-profit side, per se, advancing technology, making sure it's accurate and making sure that, you know, physicians, providers, um, the scientific world really make sure that those things are accurate. So. Um, making sure it's accurate, but yes, it will be helpful in future state. I, I think that um, it'll make the patient um, experience a whole lot more seamless by doing that. Excellent. Here you go, Dr. Lee. I like this one. This is for you, my friend. Uh, what does the future of medicine look like for populations which are not yet tech savvy? What do you think, my friend? Well, I think them with parts of their environment that do have tech imbued in them, it will help buttress them. So, gotcha. um, so for instance, uh, if, if I'm a, look, let's use uh, automobiles right now. Uh, and if, uh, if I was a, somebody who wasn't really wanting or needing necessarily needing all the technology that some of these uh, uh, cars are chock full of now, they still have automatic uh, anti-lock brakes. They have backup sensors and that sort of thing. If you can uh, infuse that sort of technology to a point where uh, it's invisible and it just happens, that's when it's gonna make a, a, an enormous difference, even to the people who are not tech savvy. The most advanced technology is technology that exists and you don't even know it exists. It's awesome. I love that line. The most advantage, most the best one is that you don't even know it's there. I love it. Very seamless right. and invisible. All right, Dr. Couture, I like this one. Here you go. What will be the role of hospitals in the future, let's say 10 and 25 years from now, and how will the patient experience change? What's your take? Well, um, I'm going to say how health systems and are going to change. I, I think a lot of the care that's actually being delivered in sites is going to shift to the home. I think we've already seen examples of organizations moving to hospital at home models, um, as well as SNF at home models. So that forces you to use technology. It forces you to use that monitoring. It forces you to have virtual technologies to interact with patients on a regular basis. And those dollars that we put up front for that, if the payment mechanisms change in the future, will incentivize not just health systems, but payers to move in that direction. So I think we have a lot of that technology now the question now for a lot of these health systems that run on kind of slim margins and are they incentivized to do that? Because that's a big change, right? Um, not just for 
a health system for patients to feel safe in that type of an environment when they're most vulnerable, but also our physicians, our nurse practitioners, our advanced practitioners, our nurses, how comfortable are they, you know, delivering care in a way that's completely different than we were all trained to do, right, at the home. But I do see that being a staple in our future over the next 10 to 25 years. So there you go, Dr. Lee, I like this one. This is for you. How, can we, how do we make sure the hype in healthcare artificial intelligence results in concrete and useful applications at the foundational levels of healthcare? Uh, there was actually a good article at an MIT Technology Review about this exact mm. uh, issue. Um, and, and basically, COVID epidemic. You would think that all these advanced mathematical tools uh, could rally some sort of tidal wave of insights that could help us out. Uh, but it has largely failed. And the underlying reason is because of the underlying data to what we have been talking about before. It's not accurate. It's a mess. Uh, us, all three of us know that, that our colleagues put a lot of crap in our notes. And there's a lot of um, uh, documentation that just doesn't need to be done, but people are just forcing us to do it. So it just uh, uh, pollutes uh, the, the, the data that's... Uh, that, um, is uh, uh, collected within our medical records. And then a lot, even more so, the stuff that even if it is accurate, it's accurate in a different way at one organization versus another. So another an analogy I would like to use is that what we have to do is create a foundation and create a, a surround, something that surrounds the, the data and the technology that we want to use. So it would be like, if you had a car from 2000, now 22, and you stuck it, and it's a really nice advanced car, but you stuck it in the middle of 1905 uh, Western Kansas, where there were tons of dirt roads, no interstates, and no gas stations, it's not going to work. So what we need to do is build the roads, build the foundation, build a, that infrastructure. What about clean water? You know, you, you have these cardiologists and these surgeons and, and all these people who, who, you know, get a lot of the glory. What about the san you know, water sanitation workers? They probably save way more lives than, than any cardiologist that we know. Uh, uh, but they, it's unheralded because to, to the point of what we made, uh, talked about before, that technology is just sort of assumed. People take it for granted and it's invisible. Seamless. Gotcha, brother. All right. Well, I got a special section here. We're joined here. You're listening to Health360 with Dr. G. We're joined here with Dr. Sanjeev Kutu and Dr. John Lee. We're talking uh, data, we're talking tech, talking future medicine innovation. I got a section that I prepared for these gentlemen uh, because I've been so excited to wanting to get to talk to these guys. But here it is. It's called The Future of Medicine prognosticate this. We're going to have a little fun. So what I'm going to say is I'm going to say the topic and then um, my docs will say either like how close are we to, how close are we to this technology becoming real? Uh, what is the potential impact on healthcare and how accessible is it to the masses? So, uh, so we're just prognosticating. It's all good. Uh, but, uh, but let's see how it goes. And so here we go. This is for you, Dr. Lee. I like this one. First statement, first statement, first topic, health sensors and telehealth. You know, it, right now, if you think about health centers and telehealth, you know, again, how close are we to this technology? What's the impact on healthcare, and is it available to the masses? What's your take on those kind of kind of kind of things? Uh, I think I get a lot of play. I think to a certain extent, um, in very focused areas, they will be used a lot. One of them, uh, like the the uh, glucose monitors, uh, is. Uh, extremely useful and, and cool. it is used quite quite significantly. Uh, some of the other ones I, I'm not so sure about. Uh, they they need to have um, uh, uh, a focused use initially, uh, but they won't be. It won't be widespread. Uh, telehealth is here, um, uh, but my take on how we're currently using telehealth um, is that it's being wasted. Uh, and if you think about what the uh, true benefit, what I think is the true benefit of telehealth or the potential is within the ecosystem of a, a true continuous population health um, delivery mechanism. So that, for instance, a 
a complicated patient, say, uh, is has multiple very low friction telehealth visits every every day or every other day, as opposed to the traditional, come in here, I'm going to check your handful of, of, of tests, and then see, I'll see you again. And again. yeah, exactly. Um, but if it's like say a really complicated patient who was just discharged from the hospital, what if you then had a, a, a 10 minute telehealth visit uh, uh, on the day of discharge in the evening, and then again in the morning, and then again in the evening? But the thing is that there's no real good mechanism uh, to pay for something like that right now. But if that was wrapped up in an, uh, a uh, population health uh, system, then it would make all sorts of sense because that little effort can make a huge difference. Here you go, Dr. Kato. I like this one. Mixed reality, augmented virtual uh, um, uh, reality approaches. What's your take on this? Is this is this around? How close are we to do this technology? Maybe an example. Um, what's the impact on healthcare, and how is it equitable or how accessible is it to the masses? What's your take on VR? So the technology is available. Um, and the question is, is how are we using it? I think for specific procedures um, to, uh, to, let's just say somebody who's gonna do some type of abdominal surgery, they would know the exact locations of that individual based on their scanning with virtual. And then they could kind of go through that process beforehand to eliminate mistakes or errors. So the technology is there. Would you feel more comfortable if your surgeon knew exactly what your, your anatomy was like before they actually went in and practiced on you in virtual reality before a Whipple curve or something like that is pretty complicated versus not. So um, as we think about scalability of all this technology, um, that, that's where we struggle. We have pockets of excellence all over the country. It's like, how do we get it to be used more widespread? And that goes back to my policy comments and the funding and a lot of things that John articulated as well. So... And you know, you know what, it, one, go ahead, Jimmy, one thing go ahead. I, I, I would make a, a comment on some of these shiny object, uh, high tech, high profile things, uh, technologies, they're fine. But I think if we solve the underlying data problem, that would be very similar to that water sanitation that I talked about before. Okay. If we can eliminate the mistakes make it easier for providers to navigate the system, make it easier for patients to, to navigate the system, we're going to do a whole lot more good than uh, and, uh, sending out a, a, a hundreds or thousands of uh, Oculus headsets to, to surgeons so that they can pra practice their surgeries. The only thing I'll say is that's table stakes, right? I think uh, for the consumers, for outside of our industry, they're going to expect us to figure that out yeah, as we think about thinking, figuring that out as we do a lot of these technologies are going to be used and the question is is how quickly does that happen does that happen us moving in unison with policy or stakeholders or not and that's going to take some time so you know i was thinking like an example and i was coming with that particular question you know i had the vision of you know a child who might be in a pediatric icu having a lot of pain maybe you can put on a virtual reality and it can kind of simulate a reality where, where there's calm, you know, kind of the, uh, like a virtual oasis. And maybe that's a way to address pain burden. And so, you know, flipping technology like that may be really awesome. Um, as you said earlier, Dr. Patu, about the medical students, uh, surgeons looking at things ahead of time, but you know, you're right. This is your example though. Uh, the definition of pop health to precision medicine. Yeah. So pop health is combining all this data that we've never had before and making use of it to understand our patients better. And once we're able to do that, that's going to lead us to a point where we can get to true precision medicine. So in that example of the pediatric patient, predicting what that individual will need and what the right level of resources are to get maximal um, outcome in terms of keeping cost low, experience, et cetera, but that's where we really need to get to, to get to precision medicine is what you're speaking of. I love it. Here you go, Dr. Lee, let me answer this question. I'm gonna change topics on this. Uh, surgical and medical robots, people were seeing this innovation. Actually, I read recently in South Korea, they have now uh, robots that are companions um, for older individuals and the robots that can actually spend time and actually detect based on their, their tone and their voice that they may be able to see if that person may be depressed and then alert their physician. So when you think about surgical medical robots, 
you know, is it, re- is it here wide scale? Uh, you, you know, is, is it scalable and is there equity? No, <laughs> I, 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 I think, I think, you know, <laughs> really good, uh, usable technology in that, in that realm is, is, is a, a ways away. I think it's going to come, uh, but, and, and, and to, to what you talked about, there are also uh, coming out with olfactory sensors too. Yeah. So that you've, you know, you know, you have these, these, uh, uh, these dogs that can sense if a diabetic is getting hypoglycemic, you'll have, we'll, we'll have things like that at, at some point in the, I think medium term future. Uh, but I, you know, I, I am, I'm biased in this respect, that sort of effort, um, if you put that same sort of effort into some of the foundational stuff that I've been talking about, it will yield results many times over, but only uh, only from per- the perspective of public health. Uh, it's not going to be. It's not going to benefit, say, Elon Musk uh, or uh, a single company, and yeah. that's kind of the problem. So let's do three D printing, fellas. So when I think about upward speed a little bit, so like three D printing when it comes to it creating something out of nothing. So, you know, thinking about things like the medical world, can we use it right now? I would say from an accessibility, how, how close are we to the technology where we're 3D printing, but we're not 3D printing medicines. We're not 3D printing or bioprinting uh, uh, limbs, uh, blood vessels, things like that. Uh, 3D printing pharmaceuticals in your office. We're not doing that. So it's not necessarily, it's not accessible. Uh, and, and of course it's not very equitable at all. But what do you guys think, uh, Dr. Lee? You like, again, you like tech. What do you think about 3D printing? What's the promise? I would actually push back on that. A little you bit. push back a little bit. Go ahead. Uh, uh, if you think about it, uh, the, the uh, vaccines that we have, many of us have received, it essentially is 3D printed. They, they took the genome uh, that was uh, released uh, by a, uh, a very brave Chinese scientist um, and then constructed uh, the, the, va- the vaccine. Essentially, it was like 3D printing the vaccine. So that was kind of molecular 3D printing. And I would say that, you know, that is an example of where I think that sort of technology is, uh, is going to go. 3D printing of, I don't know, certain types of instruments. Uh, I think that that is coming. Uh, and, and that's probably coming a little bit faster than we may. All right. Think. Hey, it's all good. Hey, we want, but again, it's like, it's like this kind of stuff is that what we need. Maybe that's the catalyst that pushes us forward. So I got it on the one. Let's do this guys. I want to switch to the session here. because I want to make sure we cover myths versus facts. It's all about setting the record straight. And by the way, those of you that are following me, I'm going to drop a couple other pearls out there on my socials about a couple other techniques that I think are going to happen, whether it's accessible and uh, what are we doing right now? But I want to, I'm going to drop some on the socials for you guys out there thinking about if you want to talk about 5G nanotech and genome sequencing, we'll talk about that stuff, but it's all good. But let's get into Mr. Facts. Here we go. This one's for you, Dr. Katua. We'll start our ICD statement. My awesome panel says myth or fact, and they explain And We're going to try to do like boom, 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 boom. Let's see what we can do. Here we go. See how many of these we can get. Dr. Katua, here we go. Myth or fact, please explain. We'll be seeing robots in the role of healthcare practitioners. Myth, you, there's a lot of gray area in medicine. You need the human component. Excellent, love it. Here we go, Dr. 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 Lee, I like this one. From general, from a general healthcare to from general healthcare to personal healthcare, the health systems change is inevitable. Myth or fact, please uh, explain. Fact please is explain. inevitable. I don't know the time frame though. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, if, uh, if people knew, truly knew how broken the healthcare system is, they sort of innately know, but if they knew sort of the, 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 the sausage making that goes behind the scenes, it would go uh, a lot faster because they would demand it. Got it, brother. Here we go. I'm coming right back at you, Dr. Lee. We'll give you this one too. Here's a statement, myth or fact, please explain. Data science will change the way doctors do their jobs. Uh, uh, is it truth or fact? Or, yeah, or, myth, or myth or fact. Myth, myth, <laughs> fact, it, absolutely. Please explain. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, so that, you know, I, I really actually, I've mentioned this to some of my uh, other like art, uh, uh, informatics colleagues. 
I really, really uh, regret the fact that I completely skipped out on my uh, statistics class in medical school uh, <laughs> because I didn't think it, had, you know, it was really boring. And yeah. but, but now um, I'm trying to relearn all that math. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, just like, and, and when we got taught that in medical school, it was all about looking at studies and understanding the uh, information generation that is occurring in literature. But what was going to start happening is because we are inundated with so much data, we start need to start uh, using data science tools to separate the wheat from the chaff. And it will uh, be an integral part of how we practice medicine. Uh, no, and it's gonna be just as important as understanding what, like, like the Krebs cycle. I don't remember the Krebs cycle, but I understand conceptually what the Krebs cycle is. Understanding basic physiology, understanding anatomy, and you will have to understand how to consume data, how to use some of these technical tools to uh, use data and technology and data science to get that nugget of uh, information that is, is going to help your patient and help educate your patient on how to use that information as well. 100%. Here we go. Dr. Kato, I like this one. Here it is. I like this statement. This is for you. Big data, speaking of data, big data will help medical practitioners understand a patient's probable reaction to a drug or potential for disease based on their DNA. Yeah, um, there's going to be certain drugs where you're going to be able to do that. Um, it won't be perfect, but it'll lead you to uh, a direction where you're going to make hopefully better decisions. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to add to that. I actually think also that well, when it comes to the future of medicine, you know, we're going to be testing, we're going to be using data to test medicines and treatments without actually doing it on people. They call it in silico. And I think that's going to be something that's going to happen. And then hopefully we can have using, the, if we mine the data properly, utilize the property, we can have algorithms and analytics then give us the precision medicine that we all want at the end of the day. So I would say also that- yeah, Please go uh, ahead, Dr. Lee. That, you know, I think we, you, you've heard of evidence-based uh, medicine. Absolutely. What's going what's gonna to start happening is that in, in addition to evidence-based practice, you'll start having practice-based evidence, and then you'll have, hopefully get this virtuous cycle where then that evidence then informs better practice. And then as, that, as you practice, then uh, that will produce more evidence and it will be a, uh, a, a kind of a, a self-perpetuating living health system. I love it. Here we go. I like it. Dr. Lee, this is for you. I like this one. Here it is. We didn't talk about it, but here's a statement. Myth of fact, please explain. Patients must, must give up some of their privacy in exchange for a chance of a better and healthier life. Myth of fact, please explain. Probably fact. Um, uh, you know, the, the, I, ideally, we would be able to completely de-anonymize or, uh, or uh, completely anonymize data, use the data um, at its height, at its most purest fidelity to create uh, information insights. But that just doesn't, that, that's, not, that's not reality. Um, there is a, uh, uh, do you know about the William Weld case? Don't. Give us, so, give, us, give us like a 30. So a 30 William Weld was a former, <laughs> former uh, governor of Massachusetts. And I think it was an MIT um, uh, student who took uh, a uh, D, or took a de-identified, uh, anonymized uh, medical database and was able to identify William Weld's data from this de-identified just because of all these other things, all these other pieces of data that surround this person, um, uh, you can actually put the pieces of the puzzle together. So that is unfortunately the uh, the reality of of our our information uh, ecosystem. Um, and what I it's what I like to call um, creepy usefulness. Last one for you, Dr. Katua. Uh, here it is. Instead of expecting patients to show up with a problem that already shows symptoms, technology and data science will enable them to recognize a problem before it gets acute. What's your take on that, myth or fact? Please as, explain. As we, 
as we get um, more data literacy on both ends and we start utilizing different forms of you know, sensors, things of that nature, we should, if things work out the way we want them to work out, we don't work in silos and, and that data starts flowing the right way, we'll probably be able to predict um, their needs some in some respects before they know um, it needs to happen. There we go. There you have it, everybody. Myths versus facts. So we have about five minutes left. This has been an awesome discussion with Dr. Lee and Dr. Katua talking uh, data, talking technology, talking the future of medicine, prognosticating even a little bit. Uh, but we still have to stay anchored in the present. We can't get ahead of ourselves. We have to figure out what we're going to do today and address today's problems to prepare for tomorrow. So that being said, I talked about the chief complaint at the beginning. Uh, which is why people come into our office, but we call it the assessment and plan when somebody's done. And assessment and plan is nothing more than us rendering a diagnosis, rendering a treatment strategy, and of course, scheduling a follow-up. So Dr. Lee, I'll start with you. Give us a few take on points for people out there, um, how, to, uh, how to be successful, but more in the sense like how to know about technology, just to have more awareness. Why should people care about the future of medicine and innovation? What, what, what's their personal stake in this? Give us a few take on points for people to be motivated by this. Um, I would say that the simplest thing to uh, use to illustrate this is, uh, our, again, our lives outside of medicine, uh, how infused it is with technology. I will, you know, I, I, I will grant you that I am probably not the typical uh, 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 consumer or person uh, uh, who's making this sort of consideration, but I will not buy a car without Android Auto or uh, Apple CarPlay. Um, just won't happen. It's it's too useful to me, um, and uh, it. And, but, but, you know, that, and that's a small example of how we're completely surrounded with technology, completely surrounded by information. Um, and we need to start putting that into our medical workflows. And there's, it's, there's a tremendous opportunity there because it's just not being done now. <laughs> it's horrible. You got it. Well, you're saying there's still opportunity out there. We've got to look at it. And that's why I appreciate what you do day in and day out, trying to advocate for change, advocate for change and advocate for usefulness of the system. So thank you, Dr. Lee. Dr. Katua, give us a few take on points. Why should people care about, again, technology, information, um, the future? What, 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 you know, what should people be doing? Well, I'm going to try to use words to maybe ex explain this. So literacy, I think, is important. I think from a consumer or patient perspective, um, knowing, you know, if you're going to use sensors, if you're going to use technology, understanding the limitations, making sure things are accurate, and, and making sure you're utilizing it in a meaningful way where your providers or your physicians, your nurse practitioners, when you do see them, they understand it as well. So when I talk about literacy, not just for our patients, literacy for our physicians and other stakeholders in the health system, which inherently is going to change the way we practice medicine in the future. So things that we've normally done in our workflows, we might not do anymore because the technology is gonna bring that forward to us, which is going to change what we inherently think our value as physicians are. And I think that's part of change management in the future. So literacy is important. Ethics, making sure that whatever we do from a technology perspective is as equitable as possible, that we have controls in place, even though you know, too much regulation slows things down, not enough, you lead to chaos. How do we get to a point where we can utilize things appropriately and how do we scale it up as a nation right to be accessible to those most in need and then the last thing um, which i think is important to me is just our overall commitment to science so i don't want us to take for granted the human element of care delivery technology is not going to solve all of our issues so if we're able to diagnose things quicker um, it's not necessarily a solve for taking better care of ourselves so we can have all the technology in the world, but if we don't eat right, we can have a quicker diagnosis, but it just means you're going to have chronic disease potentially for a longer period of time and the cost of management is going to be expensive and um, adverse to your health. And the last thing I'll say is the, the profit aspect of all of this. So if we let companies and for-profits kind of go rogue um, in trying to bring technology forward, um, John spoke about the one third of costs that's you know in, inherent in, in errors and, and duplication and things of that nature. If we allow that to happen, what we're gonna inherently do is create technology that's subpar 
which will lead to more safety and errors, which inherently will also increase the cost going forward and actually negatively impact the outcome. So making sure that we have controls in place for that to make sure that it is accurate and profit doesn't get in the way of accuracy. So what one piggyback on what uh, Dr. Katu said, uh, one of the best quotes I've ever heard is that um, artificial intelligence will not replace physicians, but physicians who use artificial intelligence will replace physicians who don't. <laughs> heard that one before (laughs) yeah yeah that's a a, that's why we're trying to stay 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 in the game so thank you guys thank you dr katua before we get to my final thoughts i want to do a section here that we do on each episode of health 360 with dr g it's called listener healthy oh yeah content here's a quote from loyal listener tg here we go quote maintaining a gratitude journal has been eye-opening and has helped me maintain the proper perspective when daily life becomes challenging well thank you tg keep crushing on your journey. And again, I genuinely love hearing about your accomplishments and your journeys as well too. So with your permission, just shoot me a message uh, at all the socials at health360, WDRG, and I'll read it on the show. Who knows your story may be a catalyst for someone else who needs to hear it. So my final thoughts are this, the future of medicine and innovation starts now. Technology, the population, patient needs, and more will continue to play a role in the future of healthcare. This will lead to more, hopefully, personalized care and predictive solutions when it comes to patient health. People, business, and science will help to create change and sustain it within the industry to optimize care. The future of medicine and innovation is only getting better, and the future we visualize is heavily based on technology and knowing how to use it. This is not a negative statement but rather how it should be. So I want to thank my guests, Dr. Sanjeev Katua, President and CEO at Unity Point Clinic and Unity Point Accountable Care, Board Certified Family Medicine Physician, and Dr. John Lee, Data Advocate, Board Certified Emergency Medicine Physician, and Senior Vice President and Chief Medical Information Officer at Allegheny Health Network. You've been listening to and watching Health 360 with Dr. G, a healthy German podcast. This episode is written by Mark D. Gomez, MD, and Tiffany E.R. Gomez. Producers are Tiffany E.R. Gomez and Sarah Zwack. Audio and video production specialist is Mike Paskey. Copyright 2022, Edward Elmer's Health, all rights reserved. For more awesome health information, visit me at health360podcast.com and follow me across all social media at health 360 wg This is Dr. G signing off. And until next time, peace out. 